Well, good morning and holy greetings to brothers and sisters, and God bless you. This is Scott Bradley, and this is the Rivers of Life Inspirational Broadcast. We're grateful for you that have tuned us in once again to another day, this day that the Lord has made, and we are rejoicing and glad in it. We are praising the Lord, as Brother Andre Crouch and the disciples are singing, praises unto the Lord our God, because the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. It's Thursday again as the time of this live broadcast, regardless of what time you're singing, if you're singing it on the playback. Uh, but of course, every Thursday morning at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time, we are on, we're sharing, and we've got a word to share with you today. So I want you to please hit the share button. Hit the share button, let other people know that we're on. This ministry grows and is growing as a result of word of mouth. It's not always necessarily the preacher uh, that's, that's uh, getting the word out, but it's the people that are blessed by the ministry of the minister, the preacher, the man of God. And so I want to encourage you to share, hit the share button. Let other people know about this ministry. Let other people know about the word that yours truly is preaching and ministering. As I feel that I'm being led by the Holy Ghost to share with you as we have today. Also, please let us know where you are viewing from. It's important that we know. I want to know where this ministry is going throughout these United States, throughout the world. It was very interesting, brothers and sisters, that even recently, uh, we've been, well, not recently, uh, well, uh, for a long time, we've been invited to different countries to come to preach, to share, because of this ministry, because this ministry is being viewed all over the world. And I thank the Lord, I glorify the Lord, I magnify the Lord, because the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. God bless Brother Andre. Thank you. We are praising and magnifying the Lord. Let's bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Listen, I want you uh, to uh, uh, get a copy of my latest book. The challenges, let me get the, got the glare out there. The challenges of the 21st century church. If you don't have this book, uh, we have many people that are, that are coming back saying how they've been blessed by it. Uh, uh, the, the, the sales have been increasing, in fact, through this media. Uh, and again, many people have said that they've been blessed by this book. They've been informed, made aware of some of the things that are challenging the 21st century church. And in fact, demonic activity. You know, one of the things that, that I think is lacking in this uh, 21st century church is that we are not aware of demonic activity. Uh, in fact, the mindset of many people today is that there's no such thing. That's that's superstition. Uh, that's mythology and all that kind of stuff. But I want you to understand that the, the devil is real and so are demons. And demon possession, demon activity is very active in the church and particularly in American society. And I said, yes, in the church. Yes, demonic activities in the church. Deceiving people, turning people's hearts away from God, uh, causing people to call other things God. Uh, causing people, you know, I, 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 I've never in my life met so many people who think they're smarter than God, you know, and have come up with reasons why, why did God do this? Why did God do that? God should have done that. I could never serve a God. You know, you know, I'll probably talk about that in the presentation today. And uh, incidentally, I want to, I want to at least op leave open. I may take 45 minutes today in the presentation rather than the usual 30 to 35 minutes. Uh, I may go 40 to 45 minutes today. Uh, to try to get everything in here today. I, I, there's, there's something that the Lord has really laid upon my heart to share because sometimes we need to go back to basics. Sometimes we need to go back to basic teaching and, and particularly now with the challenges of the 21st century church. Uh, the devil has convinced folk that have professed to be Christians for a long time and I'm seeing it on social media. Uh, I'm seeing it uh, uh, among people that I know that uh, even ministers, preachers of the gospel that are suddenly now starting to turn away from this gospel and starting to pick up other uh, demonically influenced ideologies, demonically influenced uh, philosophies, uh, you know, such things as praying to the ancestors. As Christians, we don't pray to the ancestors. It's not necessary for us to pray to dead loved ones, you know. Uh, and I understand that many of our uh, black ministers uh, we are we are trying to discover our blackness, our roots, and I understand that. And you know that I honestly believe. And you oftentimes hear me say that Christianity went into Africa before it went up to Europe. I understand what you're trying to do, but don't get so wrapped up in blackness, because a lot of black folk done, done messed up a lot of things. A lot of black folk done did some wrong stuff. 
Just because one is black does not make one right, you know. And again, I love my people. I love us as a black folk. I pre You all know I do the biblical blackness presentation, but you do not have to turn away from Christianity. I know the white man has uh, played it to his his pleasure. I know the white man is using it to keep black people in bondage. But don't forsake Jesus. Don't forsake God because of the actions of others. Now, again, that's not the presentation today. Today, I want to go into basics that we may understand. Because, again, a lot of people now are trying to profess to be Christians, but don't really know what it's all about. Uh, there's a great compromise, I've noticed, in this 21st century, and, and basically for political correctness, which is trying to say that God is in every religion. And when I speak of the religions, I'm not talking about denominations like Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, Catholic. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about other religions, Islam, Buddhism, uh, Hinduism, uh, Judaism, uh, and of course Christianity, because even within Christianity, you've got folk that are not uh, preaching basic Christian foundational teachings. What is the foundational teaching of Christianity, brother preacher? It's this. When Jesus said to Peter, uh, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood are not revealed to you. And I'm going to give you that in a second. Uh, but my Father in heaven, and I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, the rock was not Peter. The rock was the revelation that Peter received from God, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is the rock of of Christianity. Well, go deeper. That is the rock of the church. Christianity is a religious uh, title, but it's deeper than religion. It's knowing that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. That's the foundation of the church. And again, the church is not just a building or an organization or a denomination. The church is the body of baptized believers that have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and are standing on the foundation that Jesus is the Christ. And we do that uncompromisingly. We do not think that there are other ways beside Jesus. You know, you be a good Muslim, I'll be a good Christian, we'll all meet up together. No, no, that's wrong. That's false. That's not true. That's a myth. Jesus is the Christ. Uh, that being said, let's go right into the word this morning. Uh, because again, I want to deal on this theme. Uh, Going to uh, St. John, the 14th chapter, verse 6, Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. I am the way, Jesus says. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me me. That's, that's, that's what I want to deal with today. That's what I want to deal with today. Now, again, by today's standards, and I'll be very straight and honest with you, and you've heard me say this before, by today's standards, such a statement is politically incorrect. But there's a lot of political incorrectness about what Jesus said, because he was not interested in the politics. He was presenting truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Well, what's, what's, what's politically incorrect by that? By Jesus saying that no man come to the Father but by me, he's basically saying that all other religions are false in their hope. That even though Mohammed is supposed to be a messenger, people are not coming to God through Mohammed. People cannot come to God through Buddhists. I'll be more blunt with you. Basically, what they're saying is a lie. What they're teaching is a lie. Uh, because no man come to the Father but by me. Now, again, I know that's politically correct what I just said. I can get a lot of backlash for saying that, particularly if I'm in one of those countries where they believe in that. But this is the truth of the gospel. No man come to the Father but by, except by Jesus. Now, notice what he says here. I am the way. I'm not just a man pointing to the way. That's what the other religious leaders could say at best that they're pointing to the way. None of them can say I'm the way. And, you know, uh, sometimes you get these cults, they do. But, you know, they're mortal men. They fail and they die. You know, and usually when they die, the movement dies with them. Uh, but Jesus is not pointing the way. He said, I am the way. I am the way. In one passage of scripture, St. John, I believe it's the ninth chapter or the 10th chapter, one of those, when he says, I am the door. By me, if any man, he shall go in and out and find pasture. But what is he saying? I'm the door. You, there's only one door, and I'm, the, I'm that door. And you can only come through me. So Jesus constantly emphasizes that he is the only way, the only hope, the only redemption, and the only salvation of mankind. 
I am the way. I'm not pointing to you the way. I am the way. Secondly, I am the truth. I'm not just a man telling the truth. You know, here's an interesting note. The devil can sometimes tell the truth. You know, but rest assured, he's setting you up for a big lie. Uh, you have oftentimes heard me say that when uh, the serpent was talking to Eve, everything he said to Eve basically was true. You know, your eyes will become open. You become like God. You become knowledgeable of good and evil. Well, that was true. But it was setting up for the deception because the truth was not in what he said. The truth was in uh, or, or, the, or the, the lie, I should say, was not in what he said. It's what he didn't say. The deception, better word there. The deception was not in what he said. It's what he failed to say. Setting one up. Sometimes the devil will use your own words against you. Sometimes the devil makes an attempt. To use the word of God against you, like he did with Jesus when Jesus had come out of the wilderness after fasting. You know, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to bear thee up, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Well, of course, he was quoting from the Psalms, uh, trying to use the word against Jesus, but he used it out of context. He used it wrong. And that's why you have to know the truth and know the word. Amen. And, and study the word, because again, this is what I'm hearing from people today. Uh, people today, uh, I, I saw an interesting thing, and I don't want to sidetrack too much here, but again, I'm going to take a little more time today. But I saw something the other day, and I see this a lot on social media, uh, where people who obviously don't know the Lord and have read a portion of the scripture, don't even know all of it, try to take it and say why they wouldn't serve God. I was I was, I was, was uh, looking at something the other day where this one particular fellow said that God didn't like uh, people not worshiping him, so he flooded everything. Well, that's not quite the way it is. That's not what happened. Uh, there are reasons for the flood, uh, not just because the wickedness of man had become so great in the nostrils of God, it stank in his nostrils. And the Bible said that God repented that he made man, but now it wasn't God, it was man. Beside that, uh, there was a hybrid of races that had been created by fallen angels that went into men and produced a hybrid race of giants and mighty men. Well, see, now, God said, my spirit's not going to strive with man. So there was an infiltration, infiltr infiltration, and God had to wipe all of the world out, except for Noah, to preserve the human bloodline uh, for the prophecy of mankind's redemption to be fulfilled, which was Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, uh, and he shall bruise his heel, but thou shalt bruise his head, meaning Jesus would come. Uh, and again, I won't have time to talk about the seed of the woman. I've talked about that in times past. Uh, but to destroy and put his foot on the head of the serpent, crush his head, the devil. See, but again, just to say, well, God got mad, so he killed everybody through a flood. You know, not the case. Uh, something else I heard. And again, I'm going to go into this here in the word today. But something else I heard uh, where somebody said, well, why would God uh, send somebody to an eternal torture chamber in hell because they didn't believe in him? Well, again, it's not that simple. God is not sending you to hell. If you go, you go because of a choice that you have made. Now, uh, let me read this particular passage of scripture. This comes from Romans 6, 23. We know what it says. And again, I, I, I want to deal with basics today. I want to deal with basics so we would understand what it means, why it's necessary to come through Jesus. Uh, uh, Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Eternal life to live forever with him. That's the gift. That's the gift. Why would you think that you're smarter than God? Uh, because you don't want to go through Jesus. Well, you've chosen eternal damnation. That's a choice you make. God loves you. He loved the world. We know John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he expressed that love by giving his only begotten son. And what did Jesus come? Jesus came to become the sacrificial lamb of God. Now, I, I say this uh, quite often, brothers and sisters, and I'll say it again. If religion by itself could have saved a man or saved mankind, it never would have been necessary for Jesus to come because man has always had religion. Religion is as old as time. In fact, I'll say this. I know I can get a lot of y'all to agree with me on this, saved or not. <laughs> that religion has done more damage uh, in the world than anything. And you know why? 
Because religion is created by men. And men are flawed. Men have emotions, uh, jealousies, uh, the need to conquer, the be, need to be in charge, the need to be on top. Why do nations go after each other conquering? And in many cases, in the name of religion, because their religion makes them feel justified in murdering and killing people. You know, it, it, it goes back to even Cain and Abel, the first religious act recorded. And Cain became jealous of his brother's religious practice because, in fact, God accepted Abel and didn't accept Cain. The Bible said he had no respect. Well, Cain rose up and murdered his own brother over the difference of a religious practice. Why do we have holy wars, people conquering lands in the name of God, in the name of Allah, in the name of this, that, and the other? You know, uh, why do we have that? Because people want to conquer. They want to conquer oil. They want to conquer land. Uh, in some cases, they want to conquer water. Why? And so in order to do that, they have to have a religious motive behind it. That's the nature of man. He's rebellious in his quest. He's rebellious in his, his, his desire to seek power. Notice what the temptations, one of the temptations that the devil showed to Jesus. These are the kingdoms of the world. I'll give you all of them. All you got to do is bow down and worship me. Again, that was a religious appeal. You know, all you got to do is worship. Worship me. Praise me. Uh, I'll give you all the world. And you know, that's really what the devil has told a lot of leaders. And they don't realize it's the devil telling them to go into conquering the name of God, to go into conquering the name of religion. You know, same thing when, when uh, many of the people came to this country, uh, going back to, uh, I, I think about uh, Cortez and the Spaniards, uh, when they came to this continent and, uh, you know, the, the uh, people there, the, the, the people that were in the land greeted them. And the Spaniards and Cortez conquered them and killed them and, and tortured them and said, except Jesus. And the people couldn't understand what they were saying. They didn't speak their language. And many of them were enslaved. You know, what is the purpose of that? To convert them to Christianity? Absolutely not. It was for power. It was to conquer. It was to take land. You know, and they used religion to justify it. Well, that's what religion has done down through the millenniums, brothers and sisters, down through the millenniums. Uh, notice again what, what man has done. This is what man has done. This is what man has done is, re is rebellion. Now, we must understand that we are created by an eternal God. Why do I have to go to hell for he forever? The same reason we go into heaven forever. Because we move out of time into eternity. We are in time. I oftentimes say we are traveling through time destined for eternity. And the reason why that is is because God is a God of eternity. God is eternal from beginning to the end. God, where did God come from? God did not come from anywhere. He was always there. Now, don't even try to figure that out. Don't try to calculate that in your mind. All you're going to do is give yourself a headache because you cannot comprehend the things of eternity. God did not come from anywhere. He was always there. Just leave it at that. Don't try to figure it out and come up with some mathematical equation. And, 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 and you're just going to hurt yourself. You're just going to hurt yourself. You can't figure it out. But what is the point? When God breathed into man the breath of life, the Bible said man became a living soul. Not just an exist, existing being. Not just an ex existing creation. He became, has become, is a living soul. We are living souls. And as I said, we are passing through time. Time is a dimension. Time is part of the uh, four-dimensional world that we live in. Uh, we are passing through time. Time moves forward. Uh, time uh, has a destiny. You know, meaning that it, it moves from point A to point B. But the Bible said one day time was and will be no more. All of us, and listen to me when I tell you, because you may learn something here. All of us are destined for eternity. Now, man and all of his efforts down through the, through, through the millenniums has tried to create religion, trying to get right, trying to be good, trying to be good enough to go to heaven. Because even in the concept of, of, of every man, even in the concept of, 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 of man throughout time, he realized that God is good. And in order to come up and measure to God, he's got to try to make himself good, good enough. Well, out of all of our effort to be good enough, we're never good enough. Never, never. And this is something we need to remind ourselves. We're not going to heaven because we're good. Uh, I have a saying, and you've heard me say it before. And my saying is this. I do not live right to be saved. I live right because I'm saved. 
Because right living is not what saves me. The reason why I live holy, the reason why I live in an attempt, and, and, and I fail, I fail many times, I mess up, I, I have sinned, yes, of course, and I'm not going to try to come on this righteous, arrogant horse and tell you that I've never done any wrong, that, that's just self-deception. Matter of fact, let me read what the Bible says about that. Uh, the Bible says in, uh, let's see, First uh, John 1 and 8, uh, if, we, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now, to walk around here and say that I've never sinned, and when I, you deceive yourself, you deceive yourself. The truth is not in you, the Bible says. You are lying to yourself, trying to say that I have no sin. No, 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 no. All have sinned, the scripture says, and have come short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3.23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we can never present our righteousness, no matter how good we are. Because in our righteousness before the Lord. Now, what did you say, brother preacher? You live right because you're saved. Meaning this, there's been a conversion of heart. Because I've given myself to Jesus, there's a conversion of heart. And my motive is to do the will of the master. You heard me say this on numerous occasions. I'll say it again. When we walk with the Lord, there should be a servant-master relationship. He is the master and we are the servants. And the motive of the servant is to please his master. That's my motive. That's my drive in life. To please the Lord. To please the Lord. And I know doing certain things will not please him. I know living certain things and, 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 and uh, you know, lying and cussing and cheating and stealing and committing adultery. and you know, That is not pleasing to my master. So I refrain from those things. I keep from doing those things. You know, and the Bible said this, if we sin. Because again, there's still a nature about us that makes us rebel. If we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So it points us again back to Jesus. Now, uh, Jesus is the love of God expressed. God so loved the world until he expressed that love by giving his only begotten son. You know, brothers and sisters, I think about when I was in college and I had a class in psychology. Uh, and, I, and, you know, I, I really don't remember too much about it, to be very honest with you. I just took it because <laughs> I almost had to. Uh, but there was something in that class that I remember reading in the textbook that always stuck with me, even to this day. It makes me happy. It makes me rejoice. Uh, psychology is basically a, 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 an attempt at science of the human mind and human behavior, those of you that don't know. Uh, that's what psychology is, uh, human behavior, the study of human behavior, the study of the mind. Uh, they say that the mind is broken down into three portions, the id, the ego, the superego. Again, I'm not going to go into that now. Uh, but there was a portion in there that I remember reading. Uh, it said, love is unexplainable. Psychologists cannot explain love. And then again, I, I thought about this. I read this and I caught my attention. They can't explain why a man loves a woman or why a mother loves her children. Or for that fact, why a boy loves his dog. I mean, you know, there are different categories, of, of course. But there's no explanation behind it. They don't understand why. Now, they understand behavior. Uh, they understand various things. But psychologists can't understand love, even define it in, in many instances. Well, I thought about that even in college. I said the reason why they can't define love is because you can't define God. God is love. What motivated God to love? There's no reason. Andre Crouch, you sing that song, I Don't Know Why Jesus Loved Me. I don't know why he cared. I don't know why he sacrificed his life. Hallelujah. But I'm glad he did. Well, <laughs> that, that sums it up. There is no explanation. But I will say this. Uh, psychologists did say this, that love is an inner feeling outwardly expressed. So what is love? Love is an expression. Love is, is an expression. Uh, what is the type of love that a man has for a woman? It's expressed through through. You know, <laughs> you know, when I was young in love, <laughs> I used to do foolish stuff. I used to write poetry. I mean, man, I look back on it now and kind of laugh at it. It was kind of corny, but I used to write poetry. Oh, I, I, I'd write some stuff, you know, but again, it was expressing my love. It was expressing, you know, my, my feelings, you know. Uh, and of course, when you get married, there is love making. There's the passion of love making. Love making. What is it? It's expression. It's expression. 
Uh, what does a mother do for her children? They express love when well, she feeds them, she nurtures them. The uh, same with the father. He covers, he protects. Why? Because love is an expression, an inner feeling outwardly expressed. Now, you that are trying to say that God is whole, and I heard something else the other day which I thought was just mind-numbing, where a fellow tried to compare, he talked about an incident that happened in a Nazi war camp, and uh, to discourage, as I remember the story, uh, this was a priest, or a, a person that was in uh, a Nazi war camp, and uh, uh, they had, uh, any time a prisoner tried to escape, when they would catch him, not only would they execute him, but they would pick out five other people to be executed with him to discourage running away. And uh, according to the story, the man said that they were going to kill one man. He pleaded with them, please don't kill me. I'm a father. I'm a husband. And there was a priest there who had no children, obviously. And he said, I'll die in this man's place. Uh, and he reckoned the man as a Christ figure. But he reckoned the cruel guard that performed the execution as God. You know, and that and he became angry in his writing. It appeared he was angry with God that God is this cruel man who discourages this kind of thing and by taking out his wrath and killing people and sending people to hell. Well, again, there obviously was a man that didn't know the Lord. That obviously was a man that didn't know the Father. And I've actually heard other people say this, even among preachers, that God had a bad reputation among the people until Jesus came and cleared it up. Well, you know what? Again, we really don't understand the love of God and Jesus coming in the first place. The reason why the Lord turns against sin, and, and, and listen to me and learn something here, is because sin is a reproach to God. Uh, it's, it's, it's nasty. It it's, it's stinks in the nostrils of God. Remember, God is all righteous. There is no unrighteousness in God. God is all righteous. And sometimes even his righteousness cause him to eliminate the situation that's unrighteous. You know, now God is tolerant. He's long suffering. God doesn't always just go down and, and white folk hunt, but sometimes he does. Sodom and Gomorrah was wiped out because the Bible said that their sin has come up as a stink and an offense to God. And so God just got tired of it and wiped it out. Why? Because he's a righteous and holy God. Now, you go further because I want you to understand God, in spite of all of what mankind has done, still loves us. And so he expressed his love. He didn't just say, well, I love them folk, but hey, I feel sorry. No, he expressed his love by giving his only begotten son, Jesus, the innocent lamb of God. A lamb represents innocence. A lamb is a pretty much a defenseless animal. You know, I mean, he, he really can't do nothing except graze. I mean, you know, it's not, he, he can be good eating. You know what I mean? But the point is this, that he became a lamb. A lamb, innocent, innocent for every one of us that are guilty and destined for eternity with an un, uh, uh, without God. What does that mean? That means we're destined for hell. All of us that are born are born destined for hell. But God loved us. Now you calling God an evil taskmaster. You calling God an evil Nazi God that takes pleasure in executing people. That is not true. That is not God. You know, and again, to make a comparison is really unfair because you don't understand the, the righteousness of God. So God expressed that love. Hey, let me see my time here. Yeah, it looks like I'm going to go 45 today. God expressed that love by giving his only son. You know, how many of y'all, and, and obviously I can't see if you raise your hand, but how many of y'all have lost children? I think it's a devastating thing for a mother to lose a child. You know, it, it's out of order. Parents should not have to bury their children. Now, I remember one of the most saddest things that happened in our church a number of years ago was a young baby girl. Uh, when I say young baby girl, she was in grade school, you know, and she was killed because uh, some idiots with guns, which, which is a big problem in this country, while shooting in the neighborhood. This little girl was at home in, a, in, in the safety, should have been the safety of her own home, watching television. And some fool's outside shooting, and one bullet goes through the window and kills her. I thought the saddest thing in the world was to see a, to see a baby laying in a casket. And when I saw her mother, I just, baby, I'm so sorry. And I just grabbed the mother and just hugged her because I felt sorry. That, because, again, a mother to have to bury her child, think of the trauma behind that. Some of you have experienced that. Uh, thank God I haven't experienced that. But my sister uh, lost a, a, a young man, uh, her, her son. 
you know, and I remember the trauma that it brought upon her and, and uh, all those type of things. I remember quite well, you know, again, he's my nephew. Uh, and, and again, my cousin lost her son. And in many cases, it was senseless violence to gunfire, senseless violence. A lot of times they weren't doing anything. They were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Well, again, the trauma, the pain to bury your children, to lose your children. God so loved us until he put himself through that process of giving his son, his innocent son, for the sins of the world. It reminds me of a story, brothers and sisters. And again, I'm, I'm going to take a little time here. I've got a little bit more. I've got more to go here, and I hope you're getting this. But it reminds me of the story of a man who was a bridge tender. Uh, he was in charge of lowering, uh, raising and lowering the bridge uh, over a railroad uh, crossing, railroad tracks. And uh, he took his son with him one day to the bridge, uh, to the tender office, the bridge office there. And again, this man, whenever he would get the signal, he'd see the train coming, he would lower the bridge so that the train could pass the, uh, uh, safely pass over the river. He brought his son with him one day and, and, and left his son on a tent. His son went to plan and got caught in the gear. That big thing that turns. Man looks up and sees a train coming. He has to lower the bridge. His son is trapped in the gears. What can he do? He can sacrifice all those people because, of course, the train would have crashed into the river and everybody might have drowned and gotten killed. Or he could sacrifice his son. Tough choice. Hard choice. But according to the story, the man made the decision, I can't let all these people die. And so he sacrificed his son. He lowered the bridge, knowing that those gears would crush his son. That all those people on that train might pass over the river safely. Now, think about that. Think about that. This is basically what God has done. He loved us so much until he sacrificed his son. Now, not in that same scenario, of course, but the same principle. He sacrificed his son. He sacrificed his son. His son had to suffer for all of the sins of the world. His son was beaten. His son had a crown of thorns placed upon his head. His son was crucified. His son died so that all of us might be saved. So now, we're destined for eternity. And I hope y'all getting this. If y'all ain't getting it, pray that God show it to you. Because I'm trying to preach it like I've heard it preached to me by the Spirit. But he so loved us until he expressed that love by giving his son. His son was crucified. His son was scourged. His son was beaten. He did all of that and take it individually. He did that for me. He took that beating for me. He took that scourging for me. My God. He had uh, nails uh, into his hands and his feet. He did that for me. The pain. The suffering. The excruciation of all of it. Why? Because of what I did. Not what he did. He was innocent. He knew no wrong. Neither was God found in his mouth. But he did that for me. Now, he says to me, son, if you want to be saved, all you got to do is accept me. Accept what I've done for you. That's all you got to do. No, I'm going to do it myself. I've got my own religion. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, blah, blah. See, and that's why you mess up and that's why you're going to hell. It's very simple. That's why, because you're trying to establish your own righteousness. You're trying to establish that you're, what Jesus did was not good enough. You can do better. No, you can't. You simpleton fool. No, you cannot do better. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I'm putting it out here that you might understand. Your righteousness, the Bible says in the book of Isaiah, is filthy rags in the sight of God. You have no righteousness in you. You have no righteousness in you. Are you listening to me? You have no good in you. You know, I, I hear a, a false teaching that's going out today that tries to say that we're morally good. That's a lie. We're not morally good. We're morally evil. You know, somebody asked the question once, say, if God is on the throne, why does God allow all this suffering to happen in the world? And let me explain to you why. Because we all have a mind to think for ourselves. The Lord has not made any one of us robots. You know, uh, I heard a fellow use the illustration the other day, which I thought was uh, quite good. Uh, he said that he had a, uh, his daughter, he gave her a, a baby doll. When you squeeze the doll, the doll would say, mama. You know, the doll would say, I love you. All kind of things the doll said. Well, you know, the doll doesn't really love the girl. That's just what the doll is programmed to say. God could have made all this like that. Just pull the string and I love you, Jesus. Just pull the string and I love you, Lord. But he didn't want that. 
He wanted us to freely love him. We have free will. And this is why, brothers and sisters, I follow the Lord out of my free will. I love the Lord out of my free will. You know, and, and the reason for my passion toward him is because I've gotten to know him through prayer, through fasting. Let me check my time. All right, we ain't good time. Through prayer, through meditation, through conversing with him and let him talk with me. I love the Lord. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. I love the Lord. And uh, I'm saying that that because God has given us free will, well, everybody doesn't love the Lord. And as I said from the onset, people have other motives to conquer, to be in charge, to have power. You know, I'm looking at what Putin is doing over there in Russia. Why is he conquering a sovereign nation? For power. For power. Here's a man that's ungodly. Here's a man that, that doesn't believe in God. Here's a man that, that has no regard. In, in matter of fact, it's suppressed in his country. He's doing it for one reason, for power. Take over another country. You know, I do it because I can. Uh, it's quite well turning out that way. And I'm praying for Ukraine. I really am. I'm praying for that whole situation over there. But for all we know, it could be the fulfilling of prophecy. And I've been praying, Lord, let your will be done in the area. Let your purpose be fulfilled. That's been my prayer in that situation. I've been praying for the people of Ukraine. I've been praying that God uh, save many of them. But this just may be a greater purpose that God has in mind. Well, again, let me get back to my point because, again, i got time and I don't want to waste all of it. But, again... Man does what he does. The evil that's in the world today is not because of God. It's because of man. You know, uh, I, I learned something not too long ago that there's enough food in the world, which is a miracle to me, the way we consume 7.3 billion people in the world. There's enough food in the world to feed everybody three times a day. That's, that's a miracle within itself. That's the expression of God within itself. Unfortunately, everybody's not being fed. And you know why? Because poverty is in certain areas. Why is poverty in certain areas? Because the rich have conquered the poor and have left them in that state. Many of those people that are in those poverty countries are because of politics at a higher level. You know, uh, various reasons, but all of them have to do with the greed of man. So why is evil in the world today? Not God, man. Man has done it. But here's another interesting thing. How would we know God is good if it can't be measured against evil? See, you, you, you take for granted that God is good if everything good was happening. Sometime in our lives, God allows evil to happen to measure against how good he is. And so I know the Lord is good because I've seen the troubled side. I know the Lord is righteous because I've seen the unholy side. I know the Lord is loving because I've seen the hateful side. So I measure God's love against the hate. And that's how I know God is who he said he is. God is my all in all. All right. Thank the Lord. Let me get, move on here. As I said before, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us, John 1 and 8 says. But then notice what uh, Romans 3.23, all have sinned. So you are not righteous. You are not morally good. No, you're not. All have sinned. It's in your nature. To sin. It's in your nature to rebel. You know, it's in your nature to justify yourself. You do wrong instead of repenting. That's why some of y'all are out of fellowship with God. Because instead of repenting for what's wrong, you're busy trying to justify yourself and give God an explanation. And I've told y'all before, explaining to God is not repentance. Ooh, that coffee's cold. Let's get some more coffee. Uh, Explaining to God why you messed up is not repentance. Repentance is coming for the oh Lord with a contrite heart. You know, you read the 51st uh, division of Psalms when David repents for his sin. Have mercy on me, O God, according to thy love and kindness and the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out all my transgressions, for against thee and thee only have I sinned. Purge me with his, and I shall be clean. Watch me, and I shall be white in the snow. Make me to hear joy, that the bones that thou hast broken may rejoice. Restore unto me the, uh, create in me a clean heart, and renew a right spirit within me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and hold me in a free spirit. What is David doing? He's repenting for his wrong. He's repenting for his wrong. Not one time. Did he name Bathsheba, who he committed adultery with? Now, one time did he say to God, Lord, the reason why it happens because she was out there. and I, No, no, he never explained it because there was no explanation necessary. Not one time did he mention Nathan the prophet who exposed him. He came before God and repented of his wrong. And brothers and sisters, isn't it simple? That's all you have to do is come before the Lord and repent. 
And as we talked about last week, let the sanctifying process begin in us. Let the regeneration process begin in us. Let the healing begin in us. As I said before, man in his state is rebellious. And as I prepare to bring this to a close, here's the problem. What our rebellion does. Our rebellion causes us to redefine or make an attempt to redefine scriptures to fit our situations. Let's go to this LGBTQ, LGBTQ, whatever, homosexual movement. You know, I listen, I listen to what they say. I listen to what they say. I don't just cut them off. Oh, no, I listen to what they say. In most cases, they're trying to use God's love to justify their action. They're using that out of context. You know, I listened to one fellow and he said, any church, you know, suddenly he's an expert on the church now. Any church that uh, preaches against homosexuality, which is two people loving each other, you need to re-examine your values. This is what a gay person said, that the church needs to reassess its values because after all, God is a God of love. Uh, sir, ma'am, let me say this to you. And again, I'm not homophobic because I'm not afraid of you. That's a tab you may try to use me and say, well, you're homophobic. No, I'm not afraid of you. I'm not afraid of you. And I'm telling you that you are quoting the scripture or have a misunderstanding of love compared to unrighteousness. Uh, the act of homosexuality is what I've talked to you times about this before. It's not love. It's abomination. God loves you to the point where he died for your sin. But that don't mean keep doing the same thing. No, you have tried to take something that the Bible actually referred to as abomination and the Bible even referred to as perverted, you know, and trying to justify it by saying it's part of the expression of love. No, it's not the expression of love. It's confusion. It's an act of rebellious behavior. Why is it an abomination? Because it's a direct sin against God. It's a direct sin against God. And because it is a direct sin against God, why is it a direct sin against God? Because it's taken the purpose of sex that God gave as expression between husband and wife for the purpose of procreation. You've taken it and made it a dead sex, a sex without purpose. And you try to call it love. And it's not love. And you try to say that God is with us. And he's not. And, you know, sometimes we need to understand that God is not with all this stuff. I don't care what we say and say, well, it's religious. Well, I'm a, well, you religious folk, you're judgmental. The Bible says you shall know them by their fruits. And that is an unrighteous fruit, my friend. It's an unrighteous act. And the Bible says it. And the Bible says it. See, the Bible says in Leviticus, thou shalt not lay with mankind like with womankind. For all the do so are an abomination. Now you're trying to take it and turn it into love. Uh, we try to use the scripture to justify uh, our worship of the earth. You know, Mother Nature. There is no Mother Nature. Gaia. Uh, that that was part of uh, ancient cultures that worshipped the earth. And that's not worshipping God. That's worshipping the, the, the thing that God created. Even the Bible says that they uh, worshipped the creation over the creator. When they knew God, they did not glorify him as the Lord, but, uh, you know, worshiped the creature more than the creator. Uh, the earth is created by God. The earth is not God. And then I'm, this New Age movement, that time is up. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm done. Thank the Lord. But even this New Age movement that tries to say that we pray to the universe. And I'm, I'm hearing this a lot uh, with, again, as I said from the onset, many of our uh, preachers that are turning away from the Lord and falling into these things of the worship of ancestors and the worship of the universe and the universe has answered me back and the universe sees and all that kind of stuff. You're not worshiping the true and the living God. Uh, you, you, you've turned away. You've gotten off track. You've gotten sidetracked. I would encourage you. I would beg you to get back to the God of the Bible. Jesus is the only way. And our theme scripture that we wrote, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. Now, you're going to have to deal with the fact that either Jesus is a liar or he meant what he said. And it's impossible for God to lie. So if Jesus, being God incarnated in the flesh, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. If Jesus is the Son of God, like he said, if Jesus is the righteous way of God, like he said, then he's not lying. It's impossible for him to lie. 
It's impossible for him to lie. All right, our time is up. I pray that y'all got that. Share this. Share this. Brothers and sisters, you're interviewing, share it on your page. Share it on other people's page. Because again, I took 45 minutes today, but I want you to get it. Make sure you get my book if you do not have the challenges of the 21st Century Church. We ask for a donation of $15.50. Go to my cash app, dollar sign, brand 2538. Just send $15.50 and we'll get to And make sure you put your name and address. We'll get this out to you. Many people that have read this book said they've been blessed by it. They've been informed. And I certainly want you to follow that category as well. Be blessed and be formed, informed. Till next week, this is Scott Bradley saying, God bless you. I love you. I pray that you got this word today. Pray for us and we'll talk again real soon. God bless.